Good morning. You're very welcome to Glen Abbey this morning. We're going to teach a new song about Christ's total victory over sin and death on the cross. So this is called, It Was Finished Upon on That Cross. So what we're going to do is we're going to sing through a verse and then get you to sing along with us. And then we're going to sing it a little bit later on. So here's how it goes. sing that along with us again so we'll sing that again how I love the voice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary he declares his work is finished he has spoken his love to me and this is the next part of the verse though the sun had ceased its shine to sing that a little bit later so let's stand together and let's lift up our voices to our risen king
Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to see you. For those who don't me, know me, my name is David Murs. I'm part of the leadership team at Glen Abbey, and I really want to give you a warm welcome uh, here this morning. And if you're watching online, it's great that you've decided to uh, tune into our live stream. And um, God's Word reminds us that we're to enter His courts with thanksgiving and praise. And I trust that that will be each of our hearts attitude this morning that we come together with thankful hearts with hearts full of praise recognizing that we come not to meet just with each other but with god as well as i welcome all of you um, i want to pass on my congratulations uh, our thoughts and our prayers to jonathan uh, and pamela mers um, on the birth of baby george you'll see a little photo there so I'm a granda again. I'm not sure how this all happens, um, but it's uh, happened very quickly. Um, and uh, for those who like the details, eight pounds, five ounces. There you go. So uh, we will be remembering them in the days that lie ahead. If you're a member um, of Glen Abbey, you will have received a member's update on Friday, uh, informing you of a change regarding the wearing of face coverings in Sunday worship services only. Um, as of this morning, once seated, uh, you may remove your face covering if you wish. However, we do ask that face coverings, which are still mandatory to wear on entry and exit whilst moving around the building and whilst singing, and we would ask for your um, help with us and to work with us in that as we move forward. Uh, the usual medical and under 13 exemptions do apply. This change has been considered by the leadership. It is in accordance with government guidance, um, uh, but it doesn't apply, and it's important that we remind folks of this, to any other gatherings on site where wearing of face coverings is still mandatory and subject to your facilities protocol. This is good news, another step forward, so we're encouraged by that. We're going to take some time now to pray together. Before I do that, can I just mention that Charlie and Tanya Deering uh, were in touch with us, and they would like just to pass on their thanks to the Glen Abbey Church family for the thoughts and prayers and messages following the recent death of Charlie's mother. They say they were very aware of the presence of the Lord during this time and of the care and concern of the wider church family. So thank you all for that. Psalm 103 says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's stand together as we pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning with thankful hearts because we know, we know with certainty that you have forgiven us from our sins. Thank you that you remind us that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow. How can we not respond with thankful hearts? How can we not praise your wonderful name? Father in heaven, we thank you this morning that you are the God of all comfort. You come to us in our times of need to soothe and encourage, to strengthen and sustain we know that one day we will be changed. In the twinkling of an eye, no longer will we struggle with illness, pain, sorrow, death, but we will be with you, renewed, strengthened. We will be all that you want us to be in Christ. It is so incredible for us to consider, to ponder, to reflect upon, and to respond to. Father, we pray for those among us that need to know your presence, your touch, your peace. There are so many that we can think about in these moments that we want to bring to you. And so, Lord, we do that now.
Heavenly Father, hear our prayers. Father, we continue to see a world that is broken, fragile, and volatile. Whether it's natural disaster or mankind's inhumanity towards itself, we need you. We need you to come back soon. And so we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. Father, we pray for those in our families and friendship groups that do not know you. Father, we ask that you would break into their lives and reveal the truth of who you are and how they much they need your son, Jesus, as their savior. Thank you for sending Jesus into this world. For me, for each of us, for our family, for our friends, for the world. Help us to be distinctive witnesses in a way that draws others closer to you. Help us to be bold enough to recognize and take the opportunities to speak to others that you afford us. This morning, it's great to be able to uh, give thanks for the safe arrival of a another child that you have knit together in its mother's womb. And we pray for Jonathan and Pamela and um, baby George and um, sister Harriet, Lord, just uh, that you would be with that family as they get used to their new arrival. Encourage them, we pray. And so this morning we come now to sing to you, to continue to praise you, our God. We have so many reasons to do this. Help us to focus on you now as we sing together in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
draws near and my time has come still my soul sing this song again that we learned at the start of the service. It was finished upon that cross.
Father in heaven, we thank you that sin and death have been completely defeated on the cross and that we have hope through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. So may your Holy Spirit continue to grow us and encourage us now through the teaching of your word. Amen. Please take your seats. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you to Stevie and to the band. And I've got to say, it is so good to see people's faces. It really is. It's been a long, whatever it's been, March, what was that? I've lost track of the years now, 2020. Is that whenever I was doing things at home? So we've, we've gone over the last number of months. And let me tell you, I know it's hard sitting down there with masks on. I do it as well. But can I tell you, it's really difficult being a speaker up here. Um, and just seeing lots of masks, it's lovely to see uh, different faces. In fact, I was thinking back and I was looking, I was seeing Ian here in the front row, and I was thinking in my early weeks at home, whenever I was teaching the camera, I put a few pictures up on the windowsill of different people uh, to remind me that I was talking to real people. Ian, you were one of those, because you always cheer me up in the front row, so it's great. Um, and uh, it was lovely. It's great that you're in here this morning as well. Um, so it is brilliant just to be able to talk to real faces and hopefully real smiles at some point this morning. That would be good. If you feel led to do that, please do that. That's always encouraging. We are in our second week of um, e Immersed, uh, and I hope that Gilbert's introduction last week really set you up for, for the reading that you've done Monday to Friday um, that we've just finished as you've read and listened and reflected and so on. I hope you've been really encouraged by that. I hope you've grown in that. I hope you have genuinely encountered God through his word this week. And I hope as well that you've been looking at the five questions that are in the bookmark, that are in the books. Uh, we've got them up here, these five questions. What's something that you noticed for the first time? What questions did you have? Yeah, it's great, as Gilbert said last week, that we ask questions. God's word is big enough and strong enough for our questions to be asked. Was there anything that bothered you? What did you learn about loving God? And what did you learn about loving others? And I hope these five questions have been helpful and formative in your reflection and your thinking. And I've been discussing with a few different people uh, this week, uh, having different conversations and a lot of people have been telling me a lot of things that they've noticed for the first time as they've read in this way. And I started this actually a couple of weeks ago because I have to stand up here, obviously, and I have to be ahead of the game. So I'm into my, I've just finished my third week of reading. And I was looking back at my notes from week one. And just so that you know that I am finding new things as well. And even though I've taught at Christmas in those early chapters in Luke a number of times now, I noticed in a different way for the first time just the, the constant repetition of the Holy Spirit being mentioned throughout those early chapters. You know, John to be filled with the Spirit, Spirit's work in the conception of Jesus, Elizabeth filled with the Spirit, Zechariah filled with the Spirit, Simeon moved by the Spirit, and so on. There's new things to find in here as we read and as we ask questions, so keep on doing that. But my task this morning is to set you up and get you ready for week two which is no mean feat, saying that's about 14 and a half chapters, uh, to take us through the second half of Luke's gospel. And then next week, Stephen Cave will be coming to introduce us to Acts before we begin that in week three. And as Gilbert made clear last week, there are two movements in Luke's gospel. There's the coming of Jesus that he talked about last Sunday. You might remember a couple of years back, we did a series at Christmas called The Arrival. Uh, so that's that one. And then there's the going of Jesus, his exodus from earth to heaven. And again, you might remember back a couple of years ago to the series we did in the later chapters of Luke in the run-up to Easter called The Departure. And the key verse that signals the transition from Jesus coming to his going is in chapter 9. And if you're up to date with your reading, this is where Friday's reading began, and this is the key transition in the story. In other words, if this were a play, you would have had the interval, you would have had your Maltesers or your minstrels or whatever you had, and you would have come back in, and the first line you would have heard in Act 2 was, as time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Luke wants us to see that this is the beginning of Jesus' departure to heaven. This is the beginning of his final journey. 
A journey that is in one sense a journey towards Jerusalem, but in a truer sense is his journey towards heaven, towards being received up. It would be a journey that would take a number of months. So what you're going to be reading over the next week actually covers that sort of time frame, twisting and winding through different areas and towns, not necessarily heading towards Jerusalem in a straight line geographically, but certainly in terms of purpose and in terms of resoluteness, this was an as the crow flies journey. And it's this concept of journey that I want us to pick up on and use as a guiding concept for our thinking and our reflection as we read this week. Because I think it's a concept that Luke wants us to pick up on as well. And that's made clear because between chapters 9 and 19, he refers to the journey on a number of occasions. And in fact, these little mentions of the journey that if we weren't actually looking for them, we might easily miss. They are how Luke actually arranges his material. We might want to think of them as little file dividers along the way to help us, his readers, discern whenever he is making a change in focus or a change in theme. So I'm asking you this week, as you read, to look out for these. Now, if you're up to date, the first couple are already gone. They were there on Friday, the first one, as I've mentioned, which already marks the beginning of the journey. And then the second one, in chapter 10, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. They were both read on Friday. And then in chapter 13, which kicks off Tuesday's reading, it says, then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. That's another little file divider. And then chapter 17, which is the beginning of Wednesdays, we'll read, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border to between Samaria and Galilee. And then on Thursday, if you didn't know better, you'd think the people at Biblical knew what they were doing here we see this final transition marker. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. So the beginning of last Friday's, and then this Tuesday, and then Wednesday, and then Thursday, all have these little markers of change of focus. They all have these reminders that this isn't a random selection of eyewitness accounts just shoddily bundled together, but that this is structured, carefully structured material centered on the final journey of Jesus. And let me just say something briefly about Luke's writing. As Gilbert mentioned last week, Luke was a doctor. He was also an historian, but he was an ancient historian. And that's important for us to remember because many of us are used to the writing, if we're interested at all in history, of contemporary historians. And the way they tend to write is different. They present their historic material and then they intersperse it with commentary, with a, with a narration. In other words, they tell us their opinions on the history through their direct observations. But ancient historians don't work like that. We're not going to find that at any stage from Luke. They expected, and he expected the interpretation, what he thought to actually be inferred by us, the readers, through the material that he includes and how he puts that material together. Remember what Gilbert said last week, this isn't all of Jesus' story. Luke has been very, very careful in how he's put this together. So we might like to think of his account more like a biopic film. You know, something like Darkest Hour about Churchill, or Lincoln, or Schindler's List. A, a story that doesn't have a narrator's voice, but that we look at how the materials are arranged to get the perspective on what the storyteller is trying to say. Why does he structure it like this? Why does he spend time in this encounter or in this conversation or in that location and so on? This perspective and these questions will help us this week as we seek to interpret and find meaning in what Luke is saying. So, as we read... As we progress through Luke's narrative, we want to keep in mind that our primary focus is on the journey that Jesus is on. And we want to remember that this journey is getting closer and closer to Jerusalem, and it's getting closer and closer to heaven. He's just not wandering around various towns and villages. He's moving 
with purpose towards a destination. And we want to remember that. And let's too keep in mind, just very simply, what an amazing opportunity this is simply to get to know and see and grasp the person of Jesus. We get to hear his teaching on the road. We get to see his boldness and his shrewdness and his brilliance in the face of pressure and traps from Israel's religious leaders. We get to hear the values of his new kingdom through his parables, and I'm going to come to one of those in a few minutes. We get to see the power of his miraculous healings. We get to witness and see his heart, the very heart of God, as we see him weep over Jerusalem. Weep deeply over those who choose to reject him and rebel against him. We get to see his anguish on the Mount of Olives as he's overwhelmed by the profound realization of the horror of all that is bound up in his impending death. Knowing that he'll be cut off, knowing that the Father will turn his face away, knowing that the full weight of the wrath of God would be poured out on him. And we get to see his love on the cross. As he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And then we get to see his risen body doing something as simple as eating a piece of fish with his overjoyed and amazed disciples. Very simply, we get to see and hear and encounter the person of Jesus on his journey. That's a privilege that we have in the week ahead. It's important too that we mention where he's going. Luke is uh, fixed on the fact that he is moving towards Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is very significant to Jesus and it's very significant to Luke. And it's deeply significant because it must be in Jerusalem that his kingship and his kingdom can be announced. It must be at Jerusalem, the capital city of the kings of Judah, that he brings about the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Prophecies like Zechariah 9.9, fulfilled on his first triumphant entry into the city, announcing his kingship. This prophecy, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It must be at Jerusalem that he suffers and dies to atone for the sins of the world, as he explains to his disciples at the very end of Luke's account, just before his ascension. This is what is written, he says, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is important. Jerusalem is significant. But as Luke says in chapter 9, in that verse that we just read, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not the end of the story. Heaven is. Cleopas and the other disciple on the road to Emmaus thought that Jerusalem was at the end of the story, as we heard a few weeks ago in our Meals to Jesus, Meals with Jesus series. Their hope was crushed until Jesus met them on their journey and revealed to them through the scriptures God's plan. A plan not culminating in defeat, but in victory. Not in death, but in resurrection and ascension and glory. Not in sorrow, but in joy. As Jesus inaugurates his kingdom and promises his return to fulfill that kingdom and then commissions his disciples in the time in between and in the power of the Holy Spirit to witness to him starting in Jerusalem and moving out from there into the rest of the world. So as we read this week, 
we are primarily reading about Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, to suffering, to death, but then to resurrection and ascension to heaven. But Luke also frames his narrative in this way, through this journey metaphor, so that we also see our own lives through in this picture. We see our own lives of following Jesus as a journey, as a life on the road, not a physical, literal road, but a metaphorical one of discipleship. That our journey isn't one meandering around without purpose or direction, but it's a journey that is leading to somewhere, that's leading to someone. And all that's contained in what we're going to read this week Jesus' teaching as he moves from one area to the next, what he says to his disciples, what he says to the religious leaders, the parables he tells, the people he heals, all of this, all of it is of huge significance and relevance for us as we seek to make our way on our own journeys, as we seek to find the right paths, as we seek to stick to those paths as we try to avoid the dangers and the pitfalls and the traps that might catch us out as we seek to keep learning and going and growing. We'll find so many encouragements this week. Trust me, I've been reading ahead. We'll find so much inspiration about Christ and his kingdom. We'll read about feasts and parties and all of those sorts of, in terms of what that's like. We'll also find out how deeply valued and loved we are. But we'll also find many stark challenges and warnings from Jesus about our journey, specifically about where it is we're going and what that means for each day on the journey in the here and now, what that means for how we live our day-to-day lives, what that means for how we travel. And in the time we have left, I just want to focus on one of those challenges to us. And that is found in one of Jesus' parables, sometimes called the parable of the shrewd manager, sometimes called the parable of the unjust steward. And I mentioned earlier the five questions that are on our bookmarks to help us reflect and guide our discussions. And question two is, what questions did you have? And question three is, was there anything that bothered you? And I would imagine if you haven't come across this parable before, or maybe even if you have, this might be a story that both raises your questions, along with your eyebrows. And so I thought this might be a good place for us to spend just a few short minutes. So let's read this together and then think through how it speaks to our journeys of following Jesus. Here's what it says. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what's this? I hear about you giving account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 3,000 liters of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 1,500. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? 30 tons of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill, and make it 24. The master, when he heard this, commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For... The people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Raise any questions, that one? Bother you slightly? Uh, you know, uh, on, a, on a straight reading immediately, I can totally understand why to our 21st century Ears, this parable seems really odd. Is Jesus commending dishonesty? Is he praising fraud? 
well, uh, hopefully not, obviously not, but I can understand why in the first reading that might be the case. But this is, after all, a first century agricultural community-focused parable. So we're not used to reading stories like this, and we need to take a little bit of time. We have two characters. We have an owner of an estate, and we have his manager. And the manager is appointed to run the estate, organize loans of goods, collect repayments, keep the books in order, maximize the profit margins, and so on. But the owner is not happy with the manager, so much so that he fires him from his job and he tells him that he's got to return the account books to him as soon as possible. And now the manager's in trouble. His future employment opportunities are severely limited. And so with his back against the wall, he hatches a plan to be executed in the very short window that he has before the books have to go back to the owner. He goes around to the different people who owe his master, and he gives them incredible discounts on their loans. And these debtors, well, they are, understandably, delighted. And the manager? Well, now he's everybody's best friend. And not only that, he's enhanced the reputation of his master. He shrewdly used the money and the goods and the responsibility that his master has given him as a steward to gain a lot of friends who now, once he's out on his ear, won't let him go without a meal or a bed for the night. Jesus' point is very clear. This manager, he's one of the people of this world, and the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of light are. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Through this parable, Jesus is calling those who follow him He's calling us, people of the light, not to copy the manager's dishonesty, not to copy his understanding, but to imitate his shrewdness and his foresight, his forward thinking. So we go back to the question of our journey. And we ask, how does this parable speak into that? How does this parable speak into my journey? into your journey as a follower of Christ, as a person of the light? Well, it's a question of destination, and it's a question of traveling in light of that destination. Just as Jesus' final destination was not Jerusalem but heaven, so ours in him and through him, through his suffering and death and resurrection, is not death, but it's eternal life as citizens of his eternal kingdom, his new heaven and his new earth. As Paul says to the Philippians, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. This is the uh, the amazing reality of our destination. This is where we are going, of where we're headed in Christ. And so much of the warning, so much of the challenge from Jesus that we'll read and look, including this parable, is bringing us face to face with this question. Are we living each day in light of this? Are we, as we journey, are we journeying each step in light of this? Or are we short-sightedly investing all our skill and energy and time and resources and money and effort, all given to us not as owners but as stewards? Are we investing all of that in stuff of no eternal value? Of no eternal significance, living exactly the way that everyone else lives, as if, as if 
our destination was death. What do our lives say about where we think we're headed? Or are we people of foresight and shrewdness? Captured. Captured by a vision of our place and our role in Christ's eternal kingdom. Traveling differently. Knowing that we're going somewhere, so traveling light. Using what we've been given to invest in eternity. To make eternal friendships. To make provision, however mysterious that provision is for our everlasting life in that kingdom, recognizing, truly recognizing that our time here is short and that we don't know when the account books will need handed back. Recognizing that as the song we're going to sing in a couple of minutes says, as summer flowers we fade and die, fame Youth and beauty hurry by. But that's not the end of the story. Life eternal is calling to us. Life eternal is what's been given to us at the cross. And if that is what has been given to us, and it has, life eternal is where we need to be placing our hope And life eternal is where we need to be placing our investment. In his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul writes this, but you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep but let us be awake and sober. As we read the rest of Luke this week and the days ahead, as we read the story of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, to the cross, but ultimately to resurrection and to glory. And as we reflect on our own journeys of following him, let's come expectantly as we read. Let's come expectantly to be woken up. Let's come expectantly to be sobered up by what we read. To be inspired, to be encouraged, to be strengthened. But let's also come openly as we read. Asking God by his spirit to use his word in our lives to speak. To open our eyes where we need them open. to snap us out of the sleepwalk that we might be in, to lift our perspective to the truth that we're children of the light, that we're citizens of heaven, that we're the bride of Christ, that we belong to the king of kings and we belong to his kingdom, all because of his blood. And let's ask God by his spirit to guide us in living lives which line up with that amazing reality, that astounding truth. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this journey that we're going to read about this week that your son made, a journey he knew would lead him to such suffering to anguish, to death for us on that cross just outside Jerusalem. And as we read this again, this story again this week, give us a fresh realization of the depth of that sacrifice. But Father, thank you that Jerusalem was not the end of his story, that death was not the end of his story but that it was followed by resurrection and glory and the inauguration of a new eternal kingdom. Thank you that in Christ, death's not the end of our stories either. That in Christ, we are promised these glorious resurrection bodies. That in Christ, we are citizens of heaven. And that in him, life eternal 
calls to us. Capture us, capture us. Our hearts and our minds and our whole being with this vision by your spirit as we go deep into your word in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand again. so often look for our value and our worth in the wrong places. And yet as we look at the cross, we truly recognize just how deeply we are valued and how worthy we are because of Christ. 
thank you for the amazing value that you bestow on us. Help us grasp this more this week. Help us understand who we are in Christ even more this week. And help us live lives for Christ's kingdom this week, we pray.